Hi, and welcome to the second season of Literature Berks. My name is Amanda Hornberger. I'm the program director at the Jewish Federation of Reading Berks and the co-chair of Literature Berks. On behalf of our entire committee, I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight. Literature Berks is a community-wide celebration of books and authors presented by the Jewish Federation of Reading Berks in partnership with the Exeter Community Library and the Jewish Book Council. In the chat, you will see a link to purchase a signed copy of I Want, to know, I Want You to Know We're Still Here through our official book vendor Reads and Company Bookshop. Literature Berks is happy to support a local independent bookstore and we encourage you to continue to shop local during this time. Remember that books always make great gifts. Throughout the event, feel free to type any questions you have into the chat function and we will do our best to answer questions throughout the program. Esther Saffron Four was the CEO of Six and I, a center for arts, ideas, and religion. She lives in Washington, DC with her husband, Bert. They are the parents of Franklin, Jonathan, and Joshua and the grandparents of Six. I Want You to Know We're Still Here is a National Jewish Book Awards finalist and was named one of the best books of the year by NPR. I'm thrilled to welcome Esther to Literature Berks. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's so nice to be here with all of you. Uh, you know, I always look at all the faces because I can't believe how many places I've been in the world where there's a connection, where uh, somebody appears out of my past. So um, uh, let me start by reading you just the beginning of the book, which kind of sets the stage for, for what this book is about. Uh, it's, it's, first of all, I should tell you that it, it's the unusual situation where a work of fiction came first and then the real story. Uh, my middle son, our middle son, my husband always wants me to say our, our middle son, Jonathan, as a rising senior, uh, actually in Pennsylvania, no, New Jersey, Princeton, uh, had a, was working on his senior thesis in the creative writing department happened to be in Europe that summer, went to the shtetls our family came from in hopes of finding something that he, that, that he could turn into a senior thesis. He found absolutely nothing. Uh, he was ill-prepared, the time was wrong, there were so many uh, mishaps about the trip. But because of that trip, people started to come to me well, first of all, the book became an international bestseller. So if people start to come to me to complain. They would complain that he wrote about the shtetls that their families came from, these sacred places that they adored, and that he kind of desecrated the memory of it. And I, I'd have to say, well, you know, it's a work of fiction, but uh, that didn't satisfy them. And, and he made, I guess it worked for him for the book. He used his own name and he used the real names of these places. So he created a work of fiction using real names of, of people and places. Anyway, what happened after, after I stopped um, being upset that people were complaining that my precious son had written a bestseller and that it wasn't true, uh, I started to listen to what they told me. And that gave me the opportunity to start to put together the real story. So I'm going to start by reading a little bit from chapter one, which sets the stage for the book. And I can tell you that the book uh, really is a, three parts. Uh, one part talks about my parents, a little bit about their background and how they survived the war, each being the sole survivors of, of the Holocaust of their extended family. Then the middle part of the book is when I come into the picture. Uh, it's post-war Europe. I was born in post-war Europe. I was born in Poland. That's a whole story that you'll hear a little bit about in, the, in my introduction. And we as a family, me as a toddler, uh, spent the uh, first few years of my life in a displaced persons camp, which is where Jewish refugees went. And finally, the last part of the book is my decision to actually go to Ukraine, to follow in Jonathan's footsteps with the pieces of the story that I knew, now knew and see what I could find out. So I'm gonna start chapter one right from the beginning. Uh, and if you get the audio book, for some crazy reason, they had me tape chap the first chapter and the epilogue. There's a professional reader who's doing the rest of it, but so I'm practiced at this. My birth certificate says that I was born on September 8, 
1946 in Sigenheim, Germany. It's the wrong date, the wrong city, the wrong country. It would take me years to understand why my father created this fabrication, why each year my mother came into my room on March 17th, gave me a kiss and whispered, happy birthday. Piercing together the fragments of my family's story has been a lifelong pursuit. I'm the offspring of Holocaust survivors, which by definition means there's a tragic and complicated history. My childhood was filled with silences that were punctuated by occasional shocking disclosures. I understood that there was a lot that I didn't know beside the secret of my invented birthday. My parents were reluctant to speak of the past and I learned to maneuver around difficult subjects. When I was in my early 40s preparing to give a talk at a local synagogue, I decided that it would be a good opportunity for me to fill in some of the gaps of our family story. I sat down with my mother in the pink kitchen of her 1950s suburban track house on a street where most of the other houses were occupied by families of Holocaust survivors. Sitting at her faux marble laminate kitchen table, I could see the carefully cut coupons sorted into neat piles by the refrigerator, ready for the next shopping trip. In the cabinet below, there was enough flour and cereal, all of it purchased on sale to withstand a major catastrophe. A lesson, by the way, I played forward during the pandemic. I started with questions about my father and his wartime experience. He'd been an enigma, a mercurial figure that all conversation danced around, even in my own head. My mother took a sip of the instant coffee that she loved and casually mentioned that my father had been in a ghetto with his wife and daughter, that he'd been on a work detail when they were both murdered by the Nazis. Absolutely stunned, I blurted out, he had a wife and daughter. Why haven't you ever told me this before? How can you be telling me this now for the first time? Of the person closest to me in the Holocaust, my half sibling, I had not one detail, not a name, not a picture, not one piece of memory to hold on to. Here was a child, one of among at least 6 million Jews and one of almost 1.5 million Jewish children who were murdered during the Holocaust. And there was no way to remember that this child had lived. I'm just gonna read you a little bit more from this. Had, um, the search took me to places that allowed me to more deeply understand the Holocaust, that allowed, that to more deeply understand the Holocaust and how it continued to reverberate long past the liberation and into future generations. It was ultimately a search that took me to places inside myself. It's been said that Jews are an ahistorical people concerned more with memory than history. A curious fact, there's no word in the Hebrew language that precisely connotes history. Zikaron and Zakor used in its stead translate to memory. The word for history in modern Hebrew is lifted from the English word, which was originally lifted from the Greek, historia. History is public, memory is personal. Memory is about stories and select experiences. History is about the end of something. Memory is about the beginning of something. And so uh, I'm, I decided I had to put this story down. I didn't realize it was going to become a book, uh, but I knew that if these memories were to be carried on, that I had to somehow make them available, put them down for my children, my grandchildren and their grandchildren. Um, and by the way, those of you who have stories, I urge you all to write them down, not necessarily a book, but to pass those stories on. There's a lot of work that's been done on storytelling and children. And it, the findings have been that the most resilient children grow, 
the kids who grow into the most resilient adults are people who understand where they came from and understand that life is not a straight trajectory, that there are ups and downs and that people have survived before them in their family and that they can survive. And it's something I took to heart very much during the pandemic. I kept thinking, what would my mother think? She'd think this is no big deal after what I'd been through. Um, so what I think I'd like to do is talk to you about that middle period of my, when I came into the, my family's picture. As I said, my parents survived in different ways. They were both on the run. My mother had made it all the way through the Soviet Union into the stands to Zach Kazakhstan, Tashkent. She had on foot, on buggies, on hiding in, in fields, stealing potatoes, survived that way. She survived because when we'd ask her how she survived, she said luck and instinct. And uh, I, I think that was really a shorthand luck because she was always looking forward. She was imagining what that tomorrow could be better. And instinct and intuition, she didn't look back. She moved forward. She didn't look left and right. Should I do this or that? Her instincts took her forward. She was the only member of her family who, who survived her younger sister uh, when my mother decided with several of her friends to leave the shtetl as the Germans were descending. Her younger sister walked with her uh, partway as she was leaving the shtetl and her sister said, you're so lucky to be leaving and took off her shoes and gave them to my mother uh, so that she'd have an extra pair of shoes on the trip. Sadly, she lost one of those shoes and of course never saw either of her sisters again. Uh, my father, I'm not sure how he survived. I will probably never know. I I do know from a tiny picture that my mother had saved, by the way, I should tell you in the middle of this, that while my mother was the ultimate survivor, that my father committed suicide after we were in the United States for four years, that for some, somehow he could not go on. And I will probably never really understand why I, I in my own mind, I believe that it was, the Holocaust that killed him, that it was the loss of, of one of his first family and now us and life was continuing to be a struggle for him. Um, and, and hence my desire to take this trip to see what I could find out about my father, about his first family, and to try to figure out more about who he was. Um, my parents met in 1944. They had each returned to their shtetls to see what was left. There was nothing left. My mother not only had lost one of the shoes that her younger sister had given her, when she came to her shtetl, she saw somebody walking in front of her in a dress that belonged to her oldest sister. And there was no mistaking that it was the dress because it came from relatives in America. My parents met in 44, uh, like lots of survivors, they didn't know what to do, where to go. Uh, they ended up in Luj, Poland, which was the, at, at that point actually had the largest Jewish community in Europe because Jewish survivors were trying to locate other people and they were making connections in Luj. Warsaw had been totally leveled and Luj was the next logical city. At one point, there were about 50,000 Jewish refugees in Ludz trying to make connections and trying to figure out where to go. During our period in Ludz, um, my parents were married on Lagba Omer in 1945, uh, which really struck me as interesting when I was writing the book because here were Jews who had lost everything and they were still waiting to officially get married on Lagba Omer, that the one day during this period of mourning when you could officially get married and be married by a rabbi. So I imagine thousands of Jewish couples, people who had just found each other, decided to get married and to try to build new lives, but waited for Lagba Omer to do it. 
In March of 46, I was born. I was born in Ludge, our first home. Um, and I know this from pictures more than anything else. Uh, when I look at the pictures of me in our first apartment, my father holding me, I can see a beautifully furnished apartment, an apartment that has a tablecloth and pictures on the wall. And that wasn't my parents' tablecloth and pictures. It was, it had belonged to another Jewish family who did not return. Um, and those, those apartments were given to these refugees as they tried to figure out what to do with their lives. We stayed in Ludge till I was about six months old and it became clear that the Iron Curtain was descending. Uh, there were a young, Jews from Palestine who would come into Poland and said, guys, you, you can't stay here. You've got to get out. There were pogroms in Poland in 46. Sadly, after the war, Jews were still being murdered in the streets of Poland. So we, we knew that our, to get, we knew we had to get out of Poland and that, I mean, of all ironies, you had to go to Germany because that's where the DP camps were. And that's where uh, decisions were made about who can go where. So we uh, snuck into Germany in a covered wagon with a false bottom. I was six months old. My mother had to put cloths in my mouth so that I wouldn't uh, cry out in the most dangerous parts of the trip. We made it to uh, first to Berlin and then to Ziegenheim to a displaced persons camp. And again, you know, I have pictures of that period and I look at, the, I have so many pictures of that period. And I think there must have been a lot of photographers or people with cameras or Jewish survivors trying to capture these new lives they were building. The DP camps had the highest birth rate of any place in the world. Uh, these refugees who had you know, found each other briefly right after the war, started to build new families. What was interesting is that these camps, that the allies just had no idea what to do with these refugees. The original thought was, you know, there was some, after the murder of 6 million Jews, there was something like 250, 300,000 Jewish refugees. I mean, what a tiny number, what a, the remnant. Uh, in these camps and the occupied forces had no idea what to do. So they, they said, just go back. I mean, that's what you do. They wanted to repatriate uh, these refugees back to their home country, but there was no family, there was no home, there was no livelihood. And again, here, I, I looked at all these pictures and I saw you know, this happy little toddler who was mugging for the camera on a tricycle or with my white rabbit coat with a big hood on it. And, uh, and I certainly was a happy and loved child as were all these children who were born at that period in time who were the hope of the future for their parents. But we were put in these camps. And when I took a closer look at those pictures, um, as I was writing this book, you know, I, it was time to step back and analyze. I saw barbed wire fences. I saw my parents and I looking happy and well-dressed, but watchtowers, barbed wire fences, and army barracks that were not heated. Our particular DP camp in Sigenheim had just been the home for uh, Soviet prisoners of war. So they threw out the Soviet prisoners of war from these abominable situations and put us in without proper toilet facilities, without toothbrushes, without anything. It's the refugees who were cleaning up uh, and trying to make these homes. Uh, also, uh, the, um, the, the uh, DP camps were primarily in the American zone or the British zone. And honestly, the, the American soldiers, I'm just looking here for a quote from George Patton. George Patton, who oversaw the camps in the US zone of Southern Germany, wrote in his diary that he believed the Jewish DPs were, quote, this is a direct quote, a subhuman species without any of the cultural 
or social refinement of our times. So here are these people who had lost everything were now in this terrible situation and no country in the world wanted Jewish displaced people, including the United States, including Canada, where a Canadian, I think a member of parliament said, none is too many. Uh, fortunately, we made our way to the United States under the 1948 DP Immigration Act, which was passed by Congress, really pushed by President Truman. But once the act was written in Congress, he didn't even want to sign it. He had to sign it because it was the last day of Congress, but it was blatantly anti-Semitic. They were going to allow 200,000 displaced persons into the United States. Of the 200,000, because of restrictions, only a little over 50,000 were Jewish refugees, and we were among them. So how do we get in? We got in because my father falsified my birth certificate. It's only in writing this book that I figured out why he did that. Because the 1948 DP Immigration Act says very specifically that they, among the 200,000 DPs they were going to admit, they were going to admit displaced persons who had been in these camps by December of 1945. Now the war had just ended. And if you were in a concentration camp, you might have made it. But if you were a Polish Jew who was in hiding or in the partisans, there was no way you were going to make it to Germany by December of 45. And Congress really understood that. And if my parents had said that I was born in Poland in 1946, it would have been clear that we wouldn't have qualified, that it was clear that they, would, that they weren't in Germany by 45. The act also wanted 30% of those admitted to be farmers, not a Jewish profession of choice. And I found a certificate amongst the papers that I went through uh, where my father was certified as a first class farmer. I don't think he ever farmed, but fortunately he, he understood how to work the system. Ultimately, we wanted to go to Brazil, actually, because my mother had a large family there um, and we couldn't get in. The Brazilians weren't admitting Jews. And I'm, I'm going to read you something from uh, my great uncle in Brazil who tried to guarantee everything for us so we wouldn't be a burden to the Brazilian government. Wrote to my mother after our arrival in the United States. I, and this is a direct quote from his letter. Also something I found in the process of researching this book, the, this pile of letters. I am very, very happy that you eventually have found a place to end your wandering, but it's still a foreign land. There's also anti-Semitism in the beautiful good land of America. That was written in 1949. Uh, so that's kind of, that's where I came into the picture. We came to the United States, life, uh, was also filled with tragedies with my father's death and but my mother's determination to go on. I, I have, um, actually I just gave one of my sons, I have these sheets with four leaf clovers taped to them. And my mother and I used to sit in this little patch where there were four leaf clovers and we'd collect four leaf clovers. And it was her optimism, her looking for luck, uh, looking towards the future um, that, that that symbolizes. Anyway, in, in 2009, after Jonathan's trip, where he found nothing, but did get to become an, a, an international bestseller, followed by a movie, by the way. Uh, Everything is Illuminated is also a movie. Um, my oldest son, Frank, and I decided it was time for us to do what I, I didn't have the courage to do, what I had encouraged Jonathan to do. Uh, of his uh, unsuccessful, but maybe very successful uh, trip to Ukraine. Uh, we went, we went to all the shuttles our family came from. And in 2009, I could tell you that everywhere we went, we found something. We found some piece of the truth. We found people who maybe they were children when the war occurred, but they remembered something about where my family lived. They remembered the ghetto. It was, it was uh, breathtaking because 
I had tried to manage my expectations and expected to find nothing. Uh, but I found so much more than I had expected. And in one tiny shuttle where my father had lived with his wife and his young daughter, I found a woman who had played with my half sister, who told me what she looked like and what she liked to play with. And um, perhaps most meaningful of all, she told me her name, something I thought I'd never find because she was one, my sister was one among, I don't know how many, at least 500,000, I'm sure children who nobody knows their names aren't recorded anywhere because there was nobody to remember them. Uh, and today on Passover, actually on Passover last week, I had my youngest three-year-old granddaughter here who was named for my half sister. Uh, and it was, it's all been an amazing journey, a journey of tragedy and triumph. Um, and I, I, I'll tell you uh, something about the title of the book, which is a question that I almost always get on these talks. Why is the book called, I Want You to Know We're Still Here? Well, it is a story, it is a tragic story, but yes, we are still here. Our family is here. We have six grandchildren. All three of my sons are writers and storytellers and have kept the story alive. And when I went to Ukraine, I thought, well, I really wanna leave something of myself behind in this place. I wanna breathe the air, I wanna walk the dirt roads, but I just felt this compulsion to leave something. And so I uh, took our annual Shana Tova card. We do this every year as our family grows. And I'm so proud of watching it change from year to year. And I took a pile of those and did every mass grave. And we visited mass graves in three different shtetls. And uh, there was also in one shtetl, there were four or five mass graves because the Nazis didn't get everybody the first time. So they'd you know, round up a group and then um, go to another mass grave. Uh, we, I buried the card in those mass graves. And to me, symbolically, the idea, the title, I want you to know we're still here has lots of meanings. Um, who is the we that I want you to know? Who is the you? But it, it came quite literally from the fact that in these shtetls, at these mass graves, saying Kaddish, I also buried this photograph in the mass graves of my grandmothers who probably thought nobody survived. I wanted them to somehow symbolically know, I mean, I, what does it mean that I did this? I did it for myself. That, that we're still here, that there is a growing family um, that survived and their, their DNA lives on. And I would be happy to answer your questions. Yes, to... please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I know I got a couple of um, questions already. If you don't feel comfortable putting in the chat, just um, raise your hand or unmute and we can ask questions that way. I loved um, how you brought up your sister and we were speaking before the program started that this is a busy week. Um, Yom Shoah is this week and there's a lot of memory that goes along with that. Um, right. And one of the things that I always find important to do on Yom Shoah is to say the names that right. to really make sure that people go away. I always say, if you can remember just one name, that is so important. So can you just talk about how it, what it meant to you to finally know the name of your half sister and that experience and, the, and, that, and that memory making for Yamashoa and other things? Oh, it was so critical because I had scoured all the databases. I talked to survivors from these shuttles and I had one guy say to me, you know, so many babies were killed. We can't remember all their names. But this wasn't another baby. This was my half sibling. Um, and because I learned her name, I, and I know the date that she was murdered, I could say Kaddish on that date. I put her name into all the databases and the name of her mother. Uh, and last week was Passover. 
um, by the way, I, I'm just going to hold up my book. This is not a promo, but this is this came out last week, the paperback edition, which has a um, book club questions at the end and, and some documents. And I stopped at the bookstore with my three-year-old granddaughter, who, by the way, is named, my half-sister's name was Asya. And when this little child was born, she was born in the middle of the night uh, to my youngest son and his wife, who are Shomer Shabbos. And he called, and I thought, well, if, you know, calling on the middle of the night in Shabbos, this must be something. And he called to say she was born and she was beautiful. And she was named B for my daughter-in-law's grandmother. And he said, I'll call you in the morning. I want to talk to you. And in the morning, he called, how would you feel about having her middle name be Asya? Mm -hmm. And so last week during Passover, B Asya 4 was running all over this house. We stopped at the bookstore. I said, this is grandma's book and you're in it. And she, she's almost four, so she's not as precocious as I'm gonna make her sound. She started flipping through the book and let's see if I can find it. She found it instantly. She found her name. There is a, um, a family tree in the book and she goes, that's me. Mm -hmm. And she took the book back with her so that she can show it to her friends at preschool. Um, so that's, you know, not only do I have my half sister's name, it lives on. Yeah, that's so, that's so, that's so important. One of the things that I just loved in the book was people always talk about like Jewish geography, like you can't go anywhere without meeting someone from somewhere else. But this book was it was unbelievable. I mean, you went to Brazil and Israel and DC, like all across the country and everywhere you went, you found people from this Trockenberg, this tiny little shtetl. Can you kind of talk about that experience? So I have to say one of the blessings of doing these Zoom book talks is two weeks ago, I got an email from a woman who is clearly my third cousin. And Amazing. she- read the book and she, she said, I know very little about my family, but she knew, recognized some of the names. And we have been in touch and she wants to come to Washington. I knew her grandmother. Uh, when we came to the United States, all of the old people were so intrigued because here I was a little toddler speaking Yiddish. Um, so th the writing of the book has connected me with so many more people. Um, I think probably because my family tree was cut to the stump because I grew up without grandparents, without cousins. Uh, my son used to joke that we would go to Brazil. He said, who, who else's family goes to Brazil to weddings and bar mitzvahs for third cousins? But that's what I had. Um, so the, it's been an ongoing connection and the book has provided uh, so many new connections. It's been another gift of the writing. That's exciting. For someone else who might be in a similar situation or trying to find out more about their family history, particularly related to the Holocaust, what resources, what, what kind of research tips would you give people? So, you know, there's so many databases uh, and there's new information constantly coming online, which is truly amazing. Um, there is a Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw where you can contact them and they have genealogists at the Institute trying to help people fill in the missing pieces. Uh, the, the, there is a new database that came online in the last couple of years that tracked people in DP camps. Uh, it was, it's, it's, it has been in Germany for years and after the war they decided to keep it confidential. And they have recently started to make it available and you can get online and see it through the US Holocaust uh, Museum. But ultimately it's talking to people. It's uh, those were my, where my breakthroughs came from little stories, from little pieces that I was able to put together talking to people. I, I mean, I, I went to the US, uh, the uh, Library of Congress has a map room and you can get maps of these shtetls uh, 
which was really important because the places I came from changed hands every couple of years. They were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they were part of Russia, they were part of Poland. They were, um, and you're, you're able to look at these maps and see what these places looked like. You can blow it up, at, at least when I went 10 years ago, you know, it's on microfiche and you blow it up and you can see the streets and how many houses. There are lots of resources and more coming online, but ultimately it's talking to people and capturing those stories before those people disappear. I loved um, in your meeting with people, again, sort of going back to the naming convention, part of the struggle was in some of these shtetls, nobody was known really like by their name. It was like John the tall guy or like Susie the silly or like, it was just so funny to me that like everyone had a nickname and that made it even harder to figure out who your father, you know, learn more about your father and his you family. You have last names for, for long periods of time. You were, you know, uh, Yosef, the son of somebody. Um, and, and that was one, one place, uh, an important place where I was able to crack a code. In Haifa, Israel, I was talking to this 95 year old guy and he clearly, oh, and the other thing is you hear stories that people have not told anybody else. This 95 year old man, I said, well, you lived here in, uh, and this is where my grandmother lived. So you must've known the family. And I said, you know, the, my grandmother's maiden name was Bisker. And he said, ah, he said, Razel Bisker. I was married to Razel Bisker, my father's cousin. He said, and nobody knows. He's 95 years old and he's telling this to a stranger from America. And then I, I said, well, then you must have known my father. And, his, and I kept using, you know, Louis Saffron, label Saffron. I, and he says, finally, he says, ah, label the Lister. Him, the nickname, everybody had a nickname. They were known by their nickname. As you said, whether they were tall, they were short, somebody was an albino, somebody had a, you know, an Audi belly button. I heard so many fun <laughs> nicknames. Um, but, you know, these were small shuttles and people were just beginning to use last names. Um, we have a couple questions. Charlene wants to know, where did the idea of collecting jars of memories come from? <laughs> um, where did it actually start? And by the way, you can see behind me, there's a painting and a fireplace and on the mantle are the jars. They're in identical little jars. They're labeled, they look like an art installation. They don't look like a sloppy collection of jars. Um, you know, I was there in the same way that I wanted to bring something and leave it. I also wanted to take something back with me and this is in a place where the houses don't exist anymore. In, in my grandma, one of my grandmother's shuttles where everything was burned to the ground, I brought the dirt from the mass graves. And um, they're in those jars, along with lots of wonderful, happy memories. Uh, my eight years old, my eight year old grandson went to Israel for the first time when he was four. And he knows my jars, they all know my jars. He brought me back a Ziploc bag of sand from his first visit to the Tel Aviv beach. And that's there. And, you know, I, I, I look at the dirt where his ancestors are buried and the fact that this child went to Israel as a four-year-old and, and lives a wonderful privileged life. Uh, and it's the story, it's really the story of life. Uh, when my mother died, December, 2018, I was able to take some of the dirt from the shuttle where her mother was buried and pour it into her mass grave. One of the things that haunted my mother, uh, the optimist, the cheerful, forward-looking uh, mother was the fact that she never said goodbye to her mother. Mm. That she took that instinct and just ran. Um, and so I was able to um, mingle the dirt, if you will. And what did your mother think about your trip back to Ukraine? Oh my God, she was horrified. I was able to make all the arrangements, figure out, hire. I, at one point, by the way, I even hired an FBI agent to analyze photographs. I mean, I was leaving no stone unturned. All of that was fine. 
but telling my mother that I was going was the hardest thing. And I called her and I told her, you know, that I'm taking this trip to Ukraine. And she'd always said, there's nothing to see there. But I told her I was going, but I just felt I had to. And she said, how could you do this to me? Mm -hmm. And very personal. I mean, this is where I was going to the places where she had lost everybody who was dear to her. So I said, don't worry, Frank is coming with me. That's my oldest son. And she said, you're taking your child? He has babies. How can you do this? Uh, and then the next day, after that very brief, difficult conversation, she called me and she said, try to understand the fear that I live with. Then finally, there was that final call from the, hotel, from the airport. And I called her, we were ready to board the plane. And she said, take a good book, don't eat anything they give you and stay in your room and don't do anything stupid. That was her final <laughs> farewell. And then afterwards, was she, I, when you I, found I, things, was, did that give her a sense of closure at all or? Uh, the closure came when she saw Frank and I come off the plane. Uh, she made the trip to the airport to see us arrive. Did it give her, it gave me closure. I don't know what could have ever given her closure, uh, but it definitely gave me closure or at least peace. Uh, question from Nancy. You write in the book that outlasting the war didn't really mean that you survived. Is this because of your father? Are you convinced that it was because of his experiences in the Holocaust and what he lost? Uh, that's why I wrote that sentence. And there were lots of people, lots of well-known people who suffered the same fate my father did, who survived physically, but couldn't survive emotionally. Um, so yes, that, that is why I wrote that. Um, and I was going to say something else and I've now forgotten it. Um, <laughs> well, if you remember, come back to it. Another question is, did you have, do you have any conscious memories of the DP camp? I often ask myself that, and I don't know if I have memories or if I, it's the pictures. Mm. Uh, of looking at all of those amazing pictures. And these are pictures, by the way, of birthday parties and celebrations and people. I, I, there was a couple that lived in the next room and to say it was a room, there were partial dividers. And I would look through the hole every night and say good night to, uh, to the people in the next army cot. Um, and I have visited the, that couple several times in Israel. They unfortunately never had children, uh, but she was my aunt. She carried me around in the camps as much as my mother did. People were not only building new lives, they were building new families because they didn't have anything else. So I don't know, are, there, are they real memories or are they looking at pictures and listening to the stories of my mother and people in, in Israel that I have met who lived in the same DP camps, the stories they told me. You mentioned um, in your introduction that your mother saved things, but she didn't show them to you until much later on. Did she ever explain to you why she felt it was important to save certain documents? She was very practical. I don't know. I mean, it would, what I what I finally got, and sometimes she was also very clever. My my uh, sons all think she could have been the CEO of Coca Cola, but that she was at least a superhero. Um, so sometimes when I would be asking questions, I went to her apartment and so, and you know sometimes I'd open a drawer and I see a new document has appeared. And she was just giving me a little bit of new information. But the last three years of her life, uh, she lived till she was almost 99. She moved in with us. That's what she wanted. And I was the good daughter and we did it. And I happened to have a wonderful husband who made that possible. Um, and I sat with her, we were moving things out of her apartment and I said, okay, Ma, where's the box? And I just knew that she had documents, that she probably had my father's letters 
and I wanted them and I knew it was the last possible chance. And here we were two tough women sitting there and she said, oh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, we're gonna just sit here until you remember. And we sat there, I don't know for how long and finally she caved and told me where it was. And I have that box in my office. It had her ketubah, the one where she was married in Lodge, Poland uh, on Logba Omer. That's how I found out that she was married on Logba Omer. Um, it had her first Mother's Day card, our first Mother's Day in America, where my father had bought this card and it was huge and it had this soft puffy cover. I've never seen cards like this. Um, and she saved that first Mother's Day card. She saved um, letters from people to whom she loaned money. Even as a widow, she was helping people out and she saved the letters and the canceled checks. Uh, she was a planner. Uh, I found a, a savings bond for $50 for our oldest granddaughter's my granddaughter, her great first great grandchild's bat mitzvah. It was purchased when the, Sadie was born because my mother wasn't sure she would make it to the bat mitzvah. And so she bought it 13 years in advance. She did make it by the way, uh, which was uh, just so joyous. That's amazing. A question from Vivian, is there any possibility of your book being translated to Portuguese anytime soon? I run five book clubs and would love to discuss your book, but many participants would not be able to read it in English. She's joining us from Sao Paulo. So, and I have a lot, big family in Sao Paulo. It is in Spanish. And I know some, a lot of people in Brazil can read Spanish. I have not yet heard it'll be about Portuguese. It's in Spanish, French, Dutch, German, Italian. Another question, is it available in audiobook? Several pa library patrons are asking. Yeah. It's available on audiobooks. And as I said, last year it came out, last week came out in paperback and the paperback uh, does have some documents in it and some explanatory material. And my granddaughter B's name, which <laughs> in the yeah. family tree. That's very important. Were you nervous to transition from a mother of writers to a writer yourself? Horrified. <laughs> I was so nervous. I am not a natural writer, despite having raised writers. And the original plan was that for my oldest son, Frank and I to write this book together. That was kind of my cop out. I figured, you know, he's a writer, it'll be much easier. And uh, it would have been a different book. And my editor and my agent said, no, it has to have your voice. They were so smart to say that because the, the actual, there were so many parts of this that were like breakthroughs for me. It was of course, taking the trip, finding Asiya's name, but the actual sitting down and writing the story, um, it was like a therapy experience. It um, just an amazing experience. So I'm glad I did it. It's probably not as well written as it would have been, um, but it's a different book and it's my book. And I'm grateful that I had this opportunity. Absolutely. If you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Somebody wants to know what other books do you like to read and who are your favorite authors? Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, <laughs> of course, my sons, I, I decided that I need to go back and reread their books. And, and it's been amazing to see. And I, uh, you know, I, I've, honestly, I read a lot of Holocaust literature. Um, I mean, right. And yesterday I was reading Edgar Caret, who is the funniest Jewish author. Um, whose family came from Poland and he happens to be just a, a wonderful person. Um, but I, I've decided it's time to reread my son's books because I realized that now there are things in their books that they may have put in there subconsciously. Mm. Um, for example, Jonathan's second, I think it was the second book, 
extremely loud and incredibly close. Uh, the grandfather doesn't speak. He writes his messages. And my mother told me, and I guess Jonathan remembered this, that there was one survivor in her shtetl who stayed, who saw everything that went on, I guess from the hiding or heard about it and stayed to tell the survivors who came back exactly what happened to their families. And after doing that, he went to Israel and he never spoke again. And so there are things I think that uh, they picked up by osmosis that, that have made the way into their work. Um, yeah, that's fascinating, I'm sure. That would be really yeah. interesting. You showed a copy of the book. Can you explain the, the picture on the front? Yes, that's my mother and me. It's one of the many pictures from the DP camp. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is I'm just looking at the picture now. When you see me as a little girl, you can see there's, uh, I don't know if you can see this sort of a spot on my head. I, um, I was in the kitchen. It was, the camp had one long kitchen. It's like you know, nobody had separate rooms so, uh, and there were hot plates and I was playing with a kid and we somehow knocked over a bowl of porridge and it fell on me. My hair all fell out. Uh, of course, my parents were terrified. You know, here you finally rebuilding a family and this happens. And there's a tiny spot in my hair that just never grew back. But um, in that picture, you can see where this, the last spot was that uh, as my hair was growing back. Definitely. At one point in the book, you talk about um, Hasia Diner and how she talks about Holocaust memory right after the war. Um, and that's the time that you came to the States and the time that your father committed suicide. What, go, again, kind of bringing it full circle, bringing it back to Yama Shoah, what would you tell the audience? What would you like to tell people about Holocaust memory and um, the memory of your family? Oh, I think memories are so important. We just went through Passover where we shared specific stories, not the grand scope of history, but, and we tried to see ourselves in those stories. I think these, the writing of these stories and now unfortunately a lot of survivors are dying and the stories are being written by people like me, second generation and like my son, third generation. And the stories are different. Is it, did I find the total truth? I don't know. Mm. Uh, Jonathan in this work of fiction, which wasn't true, he found a message. He tried to tell the Holocaust story to his generation and it seemed to resonate. I think it's important to tell the stories, to learn the lessons. My father was made it as far as he did because somebody hid him for some part of the war. And I was able to find those people that were people who risked everything. And I'm alive today. And so are my six grandchildren because somebody did that. Um, and sadly there are genocides that are still going on. And I think, uh, I don't know what we've learned, but um, we have to, uh, and, and the refugee crisis so rings for me because my father was able to falsify documents. So we made it, mm. but there's so many people that aren't making it. Tell your story, remember the individual stories, Thinking about 6 million Jews is, is, I mean, who can deal with a number like that that's so overwhelming? But it's these stories that tell what happened to real people that you can begin to understand. And uh, it'll give you a sense of what happened and, and uh, help carry those memories forward. Absolutely. They were all individuals, which I think is something that you illuminate through this book. Thank you, Esther, so much for joining us tonight. This was a great conversation. I want to invite everybody who is able to join us on Wednesday for Arab Yom HaShoah. We will have another program at seven o'clock. We have Judy Battalion, who will be telling her new book called The Light of Days. She's talking about female partisans 
um, in the Warsaw, in Poland during World War II. It's an amazing, amazing story that a lot of people don't know. So I highly recommend if you're able to, to please join us. Thank you and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.